This video is supported by Skillshare. I've been trying to come back on sugar. Do it. You worked out earlier. You deserve it. I'm not sure if folding the bed sheets qualifies as a workout. It was two sets of sheets and they've been sitting on the chair for a month. Do it. Reward yourself. No, no, no. You made a deal with yourself. No sweets unless you went to the gym that day. You went to the gym yesterday and you did two sets. That's practically the same thing. No, that, no, that's not the deal and you know it. You have to go that day. Oh yeah, the deal. That's what, the 15th one this year? Give up. Accept failure. Eat the cake. Be the guy your dog thinks you are. Be the guy who eats cake. Your health is worth it. You're gonna die anyway. You should enjoy things while you're alive. Alright, forget it, forget it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna eat nothing. Fine, I'll eat nothing. There. One of our greatest delusions as a society is that we're a rational species, you know, that our thoughts can be controlled and balanced, that our decisions are made off of evidence and logic and reason. <laughs> yeah, we don't work like that at all. We are not a rational species. We are an emotional and social species obsessed with patterns and identity, and it can really mess up our thinking. As Michio Kaku once said, sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe. Although it's not really on your shoulders, it's more between your shoulders. I don't know how Michio Kaku would have thought that, uh, oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. There are approximately 86 billion neurons in our brain, each one of them making connections to thousands of other neurons all day, every day, and this is what dictates our emotional and physical state. But how exactly does it work? So if the brain is like a computer, then you could say the neurons are like the computer chips. Neurons are nerve cells. They create electrical chemical impulses that communicate between themselves. Neuron consists of three parts. The soma, or cell body, this is where the information is received. The dendrites, which are thin filaments that move information from neurons to the soma, think of them as the input part. And the axon, this moves information from the soma and sends it to the other cells, think of it as the output part. It also has synapses that connect other neurons' dendrites. When a neuron receives several inputs from other neurons, the signals accumulate until they reach a threshold. Once that threshold is exceeded, the neuron sends an impulse along its axon known as an action potential. This connects to the next neuron and the process repeats itself. And the more certain neurons fire action potentials at other neurons, the stronger that connection between those neurons become. This is why the more you do something over and over again, the better you get at it. Like riding a bike, for example. When you're first learning, your brain has to process all the things like keeping your balance, watching the road, moving the pedals, all of that at the same time. All of these actions created new pathways in your brain, and over time that pathway gets locked in place so that that becomes the pathway for riding a bike, and at that point you don't have to think about it anymore, it all takes place subconsciously under the surface. Now obviously this is great for repetitive physical actions, but this also works with thought processes as well. You know, various ideas, habits, mental triggers, those get locked into place over time. And a lot of these subconscious thought processes that happen over time and get locked into place, they have nothing really to do with reality and has everything to do with your brain protecting its identity. And this leads to things like biases, cognitive dissonance, and the inability to see the things that are right in front of you. In other words, your brain is lying to you. There's nothing really you can do about it, and it, and it happens to everyone. But awareness makes a big difference. By being aware that you have these subconscious thought processes, at least you can then confront them and try to force new neural pathways to create a different outcome. So let's take a look at some of these biases that cause us so much trouble, not just individually, but as a society as a whole. First up is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is one of the greatest ills that plague society today. It's defined by Britannica as the tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that's consistent with one's existing beliefs. In other words, you're going to weigh information a lot more heavily that you agree with and ignore information that conflicts with your worldview. And there are different types of confirmation biases. The first is called bias search for information. This is when people search for evidence that supports their theories or hypothesis, also known as a congruence heuristic. You know, if you phrase a question in a one-sided way, then you'll obtain the information that you want to confirm the bias that you already have. For example, searching, is the cure better than the Smiths, in Google will bring up a lot of articles that will tell you why Robert Smith's band is better than Morrissey's band. But if you search, are the Smiths better than the cure, and Google will uh, pr probably melt down because the cure is obviously better than the Smiths. That's just an objective thing. That's not a, that's not a bias. I'm not biased. Obviously. 
The next one is called bias interpretation, and this one illustrates how people interpret information based on their existing beliefs. Basically, they evaluate evidence that confirms their theories differently than evidence that challenges them. Experiments over time have shown that people rarely change their beliefs, even when they're shown information that completely conflicts with their worldview. So, you know, negative information about a political party that you are not a part of is something that you will accept easily, but good information about that opposing party you're going to be very critical of and, and question where it comes from. This is also known as disconfirmation bias. And then there's biased memory. This is when people selectively remember information. This type of confirmation bias also plays a role in stereotypes. So while a stereotype might not be true of any individual in a group, people are more likely to remember the stereotype of the entire group than the individual evidence from that singular person. So what can you do to combat these confirmation biases? Well, the first thing you can do is simply question your own research and question what sources you use to gather your information. Also widen the kinds of information sources that you consume from. Basically, read the entire article, critically analyze the things that are said in the articles to make sure that they actually do you know, align with trustworthy information. Basically, just be aware of the information you're ingesting. You know, you don't just blindly eat food or else you might consume something poisonous. Same can be said about the information you feed your brain. Next up is the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect seems to be having a moment, uh, and mainly that's because it seems like the world is running off of it right now. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias wherein people who have very limited knowledge or competence in a topic really overestimate their own knowledge or competence in that topic. It's named after the psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger. Basically, the less informed you are about something, the less you know about how much there is to know on something. So you tend to think that you know more about it than you actually do. Another way of saying it is, the more you know, the more you know how much there is to know. I can tell you as somebody who researches various topics for a living, you never really know how big a topic is until you dig into it and then see that, wow, this is, this is a whole thing. So, you know, and, until you dig in and have that realization that there's all these rabbit holes of information to go down, then in your mind, those rabbit holes don't exist. They aren't even there. You think you know pretty much all there is to know, and that gives an illusion of expertise. In a 2019 interview with Vox, David Dunning said, the first rule of Dunning-Kruger Club is that you don't know you're a member of the Dunning-Kruger Club. People miss that. Or as Charles Darwin said, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Or there's the often cited Charles Bukowski quote, the problem with the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts while stupid ones are filled with confidence. I think we've all seen examples of this in our own personal lives, but in terms of what it does to us as a society, I mean, just, you know, just look around, just... But of course this is something we see in other people, we never see it in ourselves, but we're all guilty of it too. But this is good to, you know, be aware of in yourself because the Dunning-Kruger effect can lead to some poor decision making because you overestimate your knowledge in something. You wind up making bad decisions because you don't know enough to know whether or not the decision was good or bad in the first place. And sometimes you get lucky and it winds up being a good decision and this actually bolsters the Dunning-Kruger effect because it gives you more confidence in your decision making later on. The problem is that when you think you're better at something than you really are, this creates a gap between your perceived ability and your actual ability. Making things worse is it actually prevents people from learning from their own mistakes because their perceived self-confidence skews their self-evaluation so they don't even know that they're making bad mistakes. And then there's the problems this creates on a societal level. You know, when you're in a meeting where a decision needs to be made, often it's the loudest person in the room that gets the most attention. And because this person is louder than the rest of the people in the room, they may perceive him or her as being the expert on this particular topic or task. But blustering confidence will never make up for actual skills or abilities. The Dunning-Kruger effect happens because one, it's hard for us to judge ourselves from the outside, and two, we protect our self-esteem. You know, being aware of your own behavior and decision-making is hard for most people. It requires you to step outside of yourself and look at yourself objectively. But it's also just a mental shortcut. You know, it takes energy and time to step back and critically evaluate things. It's a lot easier to just kind of go with your original thinking. And when it comes to the self-esteem thing, I mean, you know, nobody likes to feel bad about themselves. You know, when you realize that you're bad at something or that you don't fully understand a topic, that can make you feel kind of dumb. And nobody likes to feel that way, so that creates sort of a willful ignorance about your ignorance. So how does one avoid letting this effect get the best of you? Well, I can recommend running a YouTube channel because I can't remember the last time I felt smart. But seriously, no matter how small the subject might be, just know that there are rabbit holes on rabbit holes on rabbit holes of information that you don't even know about. Take some time to dig into it just a little bit and a whole world of information will open up to you. 
It also doesn't hurt to just ask other people how you're doing in terms of your performance or your decision making. They have that outside perspective that's so hard for us to grasp. Just make sure you're good with taking criticism. The next one up is in-group bias, which is defined as favoring others who belong to the same group as you. You know, think about those old classics from school, the jocks, the nerds, the band geeks, the mean girls. We just kind of naturally fall into groups socially. But this also happens even if you're arbitrarily put into groups that are just completely random. For example, say you're a big ska fan and your coworker Sam is also a ska fan. You might feel closer to Sam than you do with your coworker Alex who's into heavy metal, even though you and Alex may have a lot more in common. Luckily, there's an easy fix here. Just you, Sam, and Alex need to get together and listen to Mephiscopheles, a metal ska band that brings everyone together. Carrying on, this kind of in-group bias is bad. It leads to turning other people who are not part of your in-group into an other, and it leads to people treating each other unfairly. We even perceive people's actions differently depending on whether or not that person is part of our group or not. If it's somebody outside of our group, they're a monster. If it's somebody inside of our group, well, I mean, nobody's perfect. This probably all evolved from ancient tribalism practices that our ancestors used to protect their own groups. And while this may have been beneficial to our ancestors, we now live in a very different world where this bias can have some pretty chilling effects. One of the truths about humans is that we just love to categorize. And that includes ourselves. It just, it just makes it easy for us to make decisions. But this bias skews those decisions heavily. Studies have shown that people are a lot more willing to bend the truth or lie or cheat or steal just a little bit if it promotes their in-group. And that's true even if they individually don't benefit from this dishonesty. Because again, we're social animals. We all crave approval from our in-group. This is something I talked about in the cults episode. And unfortunately, just like all the other cognitive biases, these are very hard to remove from ourselves because they are so subconscious. This happens just under the surface. We don't even know that we're doing it. But some of the strategies that we can use to combat this include just appealing to people's self-interest. Studies have shown that when there's concrete initiatives to treat other people fairly, even if they aren't part of your in-group, then that bias is reduced significantly. And another strategy is encouraging or maybe even forcing different groups of people to work together. You know, give those people a goal that affects them both because nothing brings people together more than a common challenge. So those are some of the main biases that are screwing with our heads, but there's a lot more that are affecting society that are worth mentioning. There's self-serving bias. This is when we attribute our success to our own actions and our failures to outside forces. This can be a problem because if you don't take ownership of your mistakes, then you never learn from your failures. Ways to avoid this bias would be to practice self-compassion and be open to criticism. And there's commitment bias. This is our tendency to be committed to our past behaviors even when they don't serve us well anymore. To avoid this bias, focus on logic and reason when making a decision rather than your past behavior. Also, imagine the positives that will come from changing your behavior. And there's the illusory truth effect. This effect describes believing false information just because it's repeated over and over again. This is a dangerous practice of civil society as well as democracy. The best ways to combat this effect are through fact-checking and critical thinking, two things that we often avoid doing because they put an energy strain on our brains. The ostrich effect describes when you avoid learning negative information, including negative feedback about yourself. People often do this to protect their egos, but to avoid this effect, consider your long-term goals and how having all this available information, positive and negative, will help you to make better decisions. Reactive devaluation is when you think of someone's opinion as less interesting just because he or she is your antagonist. The best way to avoid this bias is to work with a neutral third party when making decisions or in negotiations. The rosy retrospection bias is the tendency to think of the past as better than the present. The old back in my day or make so and so great again. One way to avoid this bias is to be more aware that your memory is not infallible and is often selective in what it remembers. And last but not least is the sunk cost fallacy. This is when we continue doing something just because we've invested time, effort, or money into it even though it no longer benefits us. You might experience this, for example, when you buy a book and find that it's boring after about 20 pages, but then you keep reading because you've invested all the time and money into it. One way to avoid this bias is to remove emotions from your decisions. So, that's a lot of screwy brain stuff that we do. Does that mean that we're doomed? Are we doomed? Yeah, we're probably doomed. All these biases are things that we're all guilty of. I guarantee you, you've done one of these already today. And that's okay, it's not your fault. This all happens under the hood subconsciously. In fact, we aren't really even in charge of how we make our decisions. In an episode I did in 2018, I talked about the interpreter module of the brain. This concept proposes that there's an interpreter module in the left hemisphere of your brain that actually kind of interprets the decisions that your subconscious mind creates so that it makes sense in the greater worldview that you already have. 
Basically, your left hemisphere lies its butt off because it's not its job to discern the truth. Its job is to create a coherent conscious experience. You know, so if there's any gaps in the information or the reason in this subconscious decision that your brain produced under the hood, then that interpreter module just makes stuff up to fill in those gaps. Behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman has another way of looking at it. He sees that your brain has two different systems, a fast system and a slow system, system one and system two. System one is under the hood and subconscious really fast. System two is more cognitive, takes more cognitive energy, and it's obviously a lot slower. And because your brain is a living organism and all living organisms want to default to the path of least resistance, we usually just rely on system one to make most of our decisions. But that easy processing relies on those strong thought pathways that I was talking about earlier. It's not conducive to change or growth. So if you want to change and you want to grow and you want to be better in your thinking, you have to put the conscious energy into it. And that needs awareness. It starts with being aware of these cognitive biases that we all have under the hood and then working to correct it. But this is why I honestly think that one of the most important things that we can do both individually and as a society is just create a little gap between yourself and your thoughts. You know, understand that you're only half in control of what you're thinking. And once you get a little bit of a gap, get a little bit of objectivity, then you can work to make things a little bit better. A little objectivity goes a long way. But yeah, breaking your thought patterns has enormous benefits, not just for all those things I just talked about, but also just getting some clarity about what it is that is important in your life, what drives you, what gives you that, that spark. And if you need a little help in that department, I can highly recommend the class Choose Must, 10 Hands-On Exercises to Find and Pursue Your Passion on Skillshare. This class is presented by L. Luna, an artist, designer, and author who speaks around the world in the process of creativity and self-actualization. And in this class, she breaks down 10 exercises and tactical practices to guide you on a journey through self-exploration to find what she calls your must, the thing that drives you and gives you purpose in life. So I've promoted this class on my videos before, and I'm doing it again because I thought it was a fantastic class, and it's based on a book that I've had around for a while and helped me out quite a bit a few years ago. It's called The Crossroads of Should and Must. This is by El Luna. And it basically it talks about how we all have our shoulds in life, the, the things we have to do to make the money and pay the bills, but we also have our must. And those are the things that give us spark and energy and passion and, and give us a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And, and we usually don't pay too much attention to the must because we're always too busy with the should. And this helps you to find a way to incorporate that must into your life. And this class is basically this book in video form, which makes it a lot more digestible and actionable. This is, of course, just one of thousands of classes on Skillshare, covering everything from business essentials, graphic design, marketing, video production, cooking. Basically, if you're interested in it, there's an expert ready to teach it to you on Skillshare. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today. If you're one of the first thousand people to sign up at the link in the description, you can get unlimited access to thousands of classes completely free for two months. And after that, it's only $10 a month, which is a pretty good use of $10 if you ask me. So yeah, link's down in the description, Skillshare.com. It supports the channel, and I think it's, I think it's a great way to grow. And, I, and I, I definitely recommend this class, so go check it out. All right, thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming an awesome community, helping me out in many different ways. And there's some new people that have joined. I gotta murder the names real quick. We've got Charlie Murphy. I'm sorry, I have to. Charlie Murphy! Uh, Sai Kick Him Knelson? Why? Uh, Jeremy Graves, Nick Northend, you wanted me to call you Northend, Bailey Grace, Fexel, Damon Bichino, Craig Huggins, Kathy Daly, and Dan Jacoby. I nailed all of those perfectly. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, and just join an awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others on the side over here that might have my face on it. And if you enjoy those videos and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.